I have to say Austin was amazing. He just was such a work ethic. Um, he really wanted to get this right. So I followed my instinct, my normal instincts. I didn't go, this is a star and I've got to get him to sing Elvis. I just went, I've got to get him to sing efficiently. And then I've got to get him to sing in style, the style he wants and needs. And I have to analyze the style. So I was doing a lot of listening on my own. You know, what is Elvis doing there? What, what sort of tension is he bringing in? This is A Voice, a podcast with Dr. Gillian Kays and Jeremy Fisher. This is A Voice. Hello and welcome to This is A Voice, Season 6, Episode 10. The podcast where we get vocal about voice. I'm Jeremy Fisher. And I'm Dr. Gillian Kays. And she's back again. Yeah, thank you. back again with Dr. Irene Bartlett. Hello, Irene. Thank you so much for coming back again because we felt we had so much more to talk about. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for asking me. So we're going to jump straight in with something that's only just been released. Yes. Now, we know that you're a very modest person, so don't hate us. This is from an article about you and okay. something that's recently been um, released and come into the news. Since beginning her academic career at the Queensland Conservatorium, Griffith University in 1996, Irene has been an ever-present, if humble, and largely hidden figure behind the careers of generations of talented singers. Now that comes from Griffith News, and that is about a job that you completed earlier, which is vocal coach for Elvis the movie. Do you want to talk yeah, about that? Yeah, tell us a bit about it. Yeah, I can talk about it now um, because it's been released and, um, and it's now okay to do that. It was just one of those things that, that popped up. I got a phone call from the uh, principal musical director to say, you know, would I coach a star for a movie? Didn't tell me what hell about it or anything. The bottom line was that um, I ended up accepting the job and um, I got permission from the university to let me do that. And I would go down there on a Friday afternoon or a Saturday as they needed me. So uh, what was out, the job, Irene? You haven't told us. It turned out to be Elvis the movie. Um, and I was the vocal coach to Austin Butler, who's the fabulous star of the show. Right. And you basically had to work with him to find out how he was going to take his voice and sing Elvis material as Elvis. Yeah, that was something I was very impressed with in, in the article that you 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 stated that you didn't want to clone the, uh, you know, the Elvis sound. You did something. How did you work around that? Yeah. Uh, well, so first of all, the very first meeting, I said I said to the musical director when he asked me about this, and I said, yes, I'd be interested. I said, first thing first, I need to meet with the singer and I need to make sure that he's comfortable with me and I'm comfortable to work with him because it's got to be a two-way street here. Um, and I didn't know at that stage how long this was going to go on for. Um, but basically, um, then once I got down to the studios and the brief was, you know, we're, we're, it's Elvis and we're covering everything like Elvis had a 22 year career and, mm -hmm. um, and his voice changed dramatically from the beginning to the end. Um, primarily, I mean, age is always a factor, as we know, but, um, you know, with the, the settling of the larynx and the, the vocal factor, uh, no, the vocal, I'm, I'm a baby brain. I've been looking after babies all day. Excuse me. I'm with my grandchildren. Um, yeah, the vocal <laughs> track compliance, the vocal tract <laughs> compliance. I'll get this right in a minute. Um, and uh, yeah, basically with Elvis, you also had the problem of later in towards the end of his career, massive drug in, intake. So mm -hmm. he was, he had damaged his body, let alone just his voice. So yeah, so, the, you know, we had that conversation early in the piece. Um, Austin was in his late twenties and so he had a, a you know, young larynx and um, could already sing, but had never sung the sort of heavy material that Elvis does. So with the belting and everything. So it's male belting. So, um, yeah, I basically worked on, I said, we'll start with the early stuff where the Elvis was younger and we'll work with that. And uh, we'll work with Austin's voice, mm -hmm. see what his voice does on those songs. And then we'll get his voice, um, we'll build the stamina and get the resilience in his voice. And then we'll put on the effects, the Elvis effects. Mm -hmm. So I was very fortunate in that. I have to say I was part of a team, a fantastic team. Musical director was amazing and completely um supportive of anything that I did and he sat in on every session so that he could make sure that when I wasn't on on set that the um 
that the exercises and that were still being done continuously although I have to say Austin was amazing he, he just was such a work ethic um, he really wanted to get this right um, but they also had a, a speech voice coach and they also had a dialect coach so there, there were a few of us working on his voice but my job was to put all of their work with his accents and everything into his singing mm. so, I mean I fantastic experience and obviously he was very lucky to have you and your ability mm. really to collaborate with other disciplines mm. and, and create it into a whole for that particular singer. And you've helped a lot of artists develop, haven't you? I, I know that. Yes. Um, so, but usually in that, I like working in a team. So the vocology the idea of a vocology team, which we, we know is still quite American, uh, mm. not so much taken up in Australia or, or in England, although we do it without putting a label on it. Mm. So I've been working teams with speech paths, ENTs, um, you know, physios, all that for ages. And so this was nothing different for me. And um, yeah, it was just, I, I decided right from the beginning, my job was to address what we said last time, the function of the voice and get that working, get his, get him happy with his own sound, accepting his own sound. And um, I have to say, um, you know, towards the end when we had to get some quick stuff going, I really did um, connect him to his primal sounds. Um, because I'd already done a lot of work on his breathing and that. So, you know, it sort of seemed to be the way to go and it worked. You and, talk a lot about the, the sort of style features that Elvis had. And it's, I think it's really interesting that you were working with, as we do, you work with the singer in the room first. Mm -hmm. So you find out what that voice does, what what that larynx is like, how it reacts, what, you know, it's the whole business yeah. of the singer in front of you. And checking the function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you start to add the style features. Talk to us about the style features. Mm. Well, first of all, can I just go back one step and say what I tend to do with professionals is note the tensions. Mm. So we're because there are always tensions with performance, they're on. And, and so I want to, is this physical? Is this in the larynx? Is it just a psychological mindset? You know, what, are, what, are, what tensions am I working with? Mm -hmm. Once I get that done, yeah. So once the voice is functioning and I believe it's functioning efficiently. So efficiency is the big thing for me, that this voice is working efficiently. And again, this harks back to the last time we spoke um, because I grew up in a, in a big family and I was the youngest, um, my youngest brother who was seven years older than me, was mad on Elvis. So I grew up hearing all of Elvis. And so when they put the repertoire in front of me, I went, oh yeah, I know that. I know what that sounds like. I, I know what that is. So basically once the voice was working, then with the musical director, I just worked on the fine detail around how did Elvis make that sound? You know, because Elvis did use constriction. He did use tension, mm. but he this was an, an you know an, an amazing voice and he was able to, to switch it on and switch it off and as we know that is good singing when yep. you're able to manipulate the larynx but always be able to come back to a place of i call it neutrality where there's the voice has some downtime so that was that's how i worked on the style was looking at each song because i'd go down we'd work on a song that he had to have ready you know to go into the studio and then take it on stage um, by the way he did sing um, about 15 of the songs. He sang all of Elvis's pre-1963, I think, um, for the whole thing. And then they say very clearly on the, any interviews and on notes that basically then they spliced Elvis's voice um, into whenever it, it got to a point where they needed that really heavy sound, especially later. So even in some of the later stuff, he starts the singing. But when it gets into the really heavy belting, they splice Elvis's voice in and, and the musical director, Elliot Wheeler, did an most amazing job. Um, mm. Just a magician, you know. Um, so, yeah, so that's 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 how we went about it. Basically, function first, which is, I, so I followed my instinct, my normal instincts. I didn't go, this is a star and I've got to get him to sing Elvis. I just went, I've got to get him to sing efficiently and then I've got to get him to sing in style, the style he wants and needs. And I have to analyse the style. So I was doing a lot of listening on my own. You know, what is Elvis doing there? What what sort of tension is he bringing in? You know, what sort of constriction do we need? Or what sort of release do we need? Because Elvis was using his vocal tract in both a um, the pharynx, pharyngeal spaces were manipulated across those three areas, you know, the superior, uh, middle and inferior constrictors. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of manipulation going on, which we all do in all speech and singing. But mm. it was specific to Elvis, so I had to find out what they were, and then I sort of helped him with that. I love this because mm. basically, we again we're on the same page. What you're talking about is the singer in the room. You're talking about 
um, the style that that singer, particular singer, has to has to sing in, and you're also talking about context because mm. that context in that film was absolutely specific, and you mm. had to work with that context. Mm. Love that. Mm. And with that voice, and have that voice, um, you know, last the distance. Um, and yes. Because with a young a young man with a, a sterling career in front of him, and the last thing you know I want to do with any of my singers, I say to them, one gig is not worth ruining the rest of your career for you know so um as so we had all of those conversations up front even though he wanted to go gung-ho like all singers mm. he wanted to get to the meat of it I went no no this is the way i work are you happy with this you know we're gonna we're gonna do some voice building before we ever get into the style but i'll always tell you how i'll show you how to use the exercises within the context of the song primarily without words at first and then we'll lay our words in on top of that but um and then we'll get the emotional so i tend i know some teachers get, get good results i'm not i'm not criticizing but i don't like to go for emotion first because i think it turns on too many um un, uncontrollable tensions Yes. Um, I can't. I can't tell them how to sob, cry, or whatever. However, once the voice is stabilised, then I can use those tools and go. How would you? How would you complain? How would you winch? How would you whine? You know, um, but not mm. just wind, whine, sob, because mm. that's yeah. you can do something. Mm. That is a very interesting perception, mm. I mm -hmm. think, about getting a sort of. It's a bit like. Um, and I, you know, none of us in this room think that there's only one balance, mm -hmm. but it's a little bit like getting a, you know, a physical alignment, physical balance from which you can move into other positions. Well, this is essentially the neutral that we talk about and we yeah. talked about it for years and it's not even, it, it's still a dynamic thing. I mean, what you're talking about is, is it's almost like you want to find that person's vocal balance around this style before we put any of the features on it. I think um, vocal and, balance is a great way of saying it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's, um, there was something also that you've said, because you're listening for tensions that already exist. Mm. which I love, mm. love that. I haven't heard that before, really like it. And that's actually what we do is we listen for, is the tension that somebody is carrying appropriate for what they, they need? Mm. Can they switch it on and off, which is massive. That, just that point at all. Can you switch that tension on and off? If you can, then it's serving you. Yes. If you can't, you're serving it. Exactly. And we and need to do something about it. Well, there'll be consequences. And we all know that young voices are resilient. We've all been young. We all know what that's like and recover quickly. But, you know, when you're working with professionals in the industry, music theatre people, film people, whatever, you know, my gig singers, basically, I want them to have as long a career as they want to have. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I try and teach them all the time to um, to not need me. So, I like I was doing with him, I was, giving, I was training him exactly the same way I would train my three, four-year, five-year university students and only i didn't have that amount of time but i i i avoided going off piece and trying to create something you know for this particular thing because he was a movie star no i went no no he's a student standing in front of me i will teach him the way i teach i've got time it wasn't a, you know it wasn't a three week fix mm. it was i had weeks with him and then of course covid came shut it all down mm. and then we started up again as soon as covid lifted and of course we had we were pretty lucky in Queensland. Mm. It was it was quite easy for us to open up again. Um, so, and um, yeah, so that's that's what happened. And uh, yeah, it was a very enjoyable experience. The, the crew was phenomenal. They they were just the whole team was just everybody was interested in what everybody else was doing. So, the voice specialist or the voice coach um, came and sat in on lessons. Just said, "Would mm. you mind if I watch what you're doing?" And then I went to watch her work with him in a acting position where he then had to sing so you know I could watch what she was doing and then build on that so it was this lovely um conversation between the two of us all of us mm. actually mm. I mean that it, that's I mean it just sounds like an ideal model doesn't it when you're in that situation where you've got to coach the star for a specific thing that it's the collaborative work and also the patience you know saying this will take time yes because it's not like doing a yeah. take you know, it's no, exactly. not like we're, we're going to do a little micro thing on this note. Mm. Full run, um, every time. doesn't work. Mm. And it was a full visual run as well as a, um, it's the way Baz Luhrmann works, it's visual and voice. It's, it, yes. it, he doesn't like to cut and paste. It's, it's basically 
what it is, you know. And so, yeah, that was, it was, it was terrific. Anyway, that's, um, that was, that was that. But I said to people, people said, oh, you really were excited. I went, no, it's another job. You know, it was, it was what I do. It's what I've been doing mm. all my life, basically, well, not all my life, but I've been doing for the last 30 odd years. So um, it, for me, it was just uh, an, int it was very interesting to go into that world in a studio situation because I had to be at the studios all the time when I was working with him. We're going to bring you back to um, the world that you normally inhabit, your day-to-day -day job. <laughs> um, we want to talk about the pedagogy programme that you run because we have taught on it and both of us thought it was unique and mm. brilliant. Yeah, I mean, why did you do it? And how did you go about setting up something like that? Tell us more about that. Okay, so I, I first started teaching into, there was an, a pedagogy course that was being run by um, a wonderful classical teacher called Adele Nesbitt, who's retired 10 years or more now. It was basically a classical voice course. It was part of the classical voice. And um, jazz voice sits under the jazz umbrella. I think I said that last time as well. Whereas classical voice is independent of classical orchestral music. You know, it's a separate entity. So anyway, um, what happened was um, all of a sudden, um, Adele came to me and she said, look, we're getting applicants who are contemporary singers. And at first it was two, you know, mostly it was still classical. There might be, you know, eight classicals and two contemporary. It was that sort of number. Um, and um, she said, would you come in and do a, a couple of lectures? So I started just by doing a couple of lectures in a trimester with everybody in the, in the space. Um, but it was interesting that, uh, another story, but the, some of the classical um, kids as you know I call them kids students um, the arrogance of youth you know they sort of said to one of my students without realizing she was one of my students um you know why is why is this pop person teaching us you know so <laughs> that was really truly and my student came back and told me so I made mention of it in the next lecture which was uh, and I have to say the credit to that was a young man he came up to me at the end of the second lecture and said I have to apologise to you because I, I thought you were just a pop teacher. So that was interesting. But anyway, that's how it all started. Um, and then what happened was, it's the times we live in, more and more contemporary teachers, they were hungry. They were hungry for, you know, either to start teaching or, you know, they'd been teaching from what they knew from being gig performers and wanted their background knowledge. Um, mm. So we start, and all of a sudden the balance started to shift. And so eventually Adele and I were team teaching uh, because we had such a, a huge mix. And at first it was almost half and half and then it started to tip towards contemporary, you know. Um, and so when Ad Adele retired and she, you know, God bless her, she gave me notice that, that she was going to be retiring. So I started to rewrite the program based on what she was teaching. There was nothing wrong with what she was teaching. The, her, her knowledge of anatomy and physiology was fantastic. Mm. But I was starting to gear it more towards how do we uh, reconcile style if we've got majorly different people, uh, singers in our, in our space. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, that's the first thing I didn't, I, I was writing that while she was still in charge. And then when she retired, I became the head of pedagogy. So in that first year, it was sort of a wish and a prayer. And I put, I threw everything I'd written into this program just to see, and, and luckily it worked. <laughs> so, cause it could have been a disaster, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. And um, we're at the point now where we have more than two, th no, more than three quarters of our students are contemporary based. I'm talking, sorry, with contemporary music theater, which we said we'd call a separate genre, but mm -hmm. they're singing all styles from rock through to jazz music theater um everything in between and then we've only got only ever, ever in each year got you know maybe three four classical because last year we had 24 people enroll mm. so you know, it's a it's in demand um but the the ratio has changed so do you want me to go on with this because i just mm. want to say what happened then was the development was when i realized this was happening um i didn't then want the classical students to feel the way the contemporary ones did originally. I was yes. determined that wasn't going to happen. So um, so Ron Morris came on board then with me and um, in the first year, basically, I said, this is the program I've written. And he said, great, looks fantastic. Um, and because he's a voice scientist as well. So the two of us just put the underlying programming, took it away from um, 
one-to-one -one teaching type tuition because a lot of our people are already teachers they know what they're doing yeah mm -hmm. um, we don't want to teach them to recreate the wheel or or, or put them offside because we're telling them that something they know is is probably not right you know so we've got to it in another way we went to it through voice science so the first pro the first course they do is anatomy and physiology of the voice and that is mind-blowing for a lot of them mm. because they've they've read they've been to conferences and you know but to get that a whole trimester of you know really intense work on and the second in a second trimester that same unit it's ped one ped two is acoustics it's fully acoustics and they learn mm -hmm. to understand and be able to work on spectrograms and and uh, phonograms and apart from just doing perceptual analysis which we all do um, they've got to be able to do that as well but we we show them the science the real science side and they get very excited and they have to do a lot of research. So I think it's really important for people to hear this because one thing I was very aware of when we came was there was a very strong sense of inclusivity. Mm. I mean, you know, we came in and, and did we did two pedagogy practicums, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. The first years and yeah, the second years. Yeah. And the way that people were able to discuss things and the way that you and uh, Ron Morris also guided. Yeah. So it was very much curated discussion, particularly the first years. Um, in terms of what is that exercise for, how is it applied, where, where does it come from, you know, the understanding of that. So there was never any sense that one genre was better than another. Mm. And that's what that the main thing, um, the feedback we get um, from the students when they graduate, and it's every, just about every course, someone writes, my mind is so open now mm. that I, I just understand that we just all teach music, we all teach singing, mm. and that one style is no better than the other, it's just what the student wants and needs. Um, and so basically, yeah, so the other thing that Ron and I can do um, as, a, as a duo, so to speak, is, you know, he's fully classical, I'm fully contemporary in terms of performance. Mm. So we, we demonstrate, if they ask us, well, how does that work on a classical voice, that exercise, or how does it work? We can make the same exercise work on any voice. Yes. Uh, Yes. We just adapt, adapt uh, to, uh, to octave, of course, um, to um, register, whatever you want to name it, but basically the lower register, the upper register. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's, that works brilliantly because they get, uh, we give all of our students get one-on-one -on -one lessons. Mm -hmm. In addition, so they don't just get the coursework, they get one-to-one -one lessons. So the idea is they go to the lectures, they gain this theoretical academic knowledge, okay, scientific knowledge. Um, in practicum, they then put that into practice for teaching. But in the meantime, they have their one-on-one -on -one lesson as well, where they have to be the student. So all of a sudden, they, they step out of the role of the teacher and they have to know what it feels like to be the student in the room. And I love that. I love that. You are, you're basically, you're hitting three targets, which yeah. I think is, is wonderful. Because you've got the knowledge gain, mm. but the knowledge gain is simply intellectual understanding with no practical application and i feel very strongly about this mm. that people just gather facts yes. like their bricks and then try and build a, a house without a plan yeah. um the second thing is the the pedagogy aspect which is how you teach it to other people mm. and for me the difference between a singer and a teacher is that the singer is always working on their own voice and the teacher never works on their own voice uh, it's actually they are always working with someone else's voice mm. and it's a completely different set of instructions and also yeah. a, a lot of teachers process you know their understanding via their own voice mm -hmm. so for example one may not be a great belter but if you understand how to approach that sound and what it feels like in your voice then you have a much better chance of being able to help someone else do it and you know it's not just the theory that will help you exactly but i think that underlying the understanding of what you're asking from the instrument even with basic exercise i, I say to my teachers my students what are you asking someone to do when you ask them to warm up what what are you expecting them to be able to do muscularly psychologically mm -hmm. process you know, um, their neurological processing when you say sing a five note scale Which and five they go, notes, please. But, it's easy, but it's easy and i said well actually it's not easy yeah. <laughs> it's not because you, you know we have to what a good teacher has to be able to do is to get rid of as much inference as possible. We have to know that when we're asking a student a question, they're receiving that question the way we mean it to be received. So you might have to ask a question three or four ways, 
before you actually understand the way the student is is processing that mm -hmm. question. Yes. Mm -hmm. We have a in the third trimester they do um, internship, and uh, one of the things I do is we um, I was fortunate enough to do the critical response process. Um, um, and I did that in Finland. I, I was completely confronted myself. It was a week at Sibelius at the retreat. Uh, so I now teach them, I take them through that whole process and say, you know, this is a process of listening, of knowing how to ask an open question rather than a closed question. So what I'm trying to say is we, there's so many ways to there's so many ways to skin a cat basically and i love cats so i shouldn't say that but there's there's so many ways of of getting someone to under getting you sorry yourself to understand how they're receiving the information you're giving them yes otherwise it remains information yes you know it, it never gets used yes mm. so the critical response process will put that in the notes and i think there are mm. a couple of youtube videos about mm. it aren't there there's something i want to pick up on which i think is really interesting which is what you're talking about is your own hidden beliefs and mm. your own hidden understandings that you don't even know they're hidden so you don't even know they're there yeah. and so when you ask a question or i mean my favorite one is sing a five note scale yeah. and i'm going as a classical singer the five note scale is absolutely embedded in your training but as a pop singer age 16 yeah. Which five notes would you like me to sing? It's not even a pattern that I recognize. Is it five notes from a pentatonic, you know, because that's what they don't know that, but that's what they're hearing, you know, yes. or is it, yeah. is it a diatonic scale or whatever? But so, yes, straight away, Jeremy, you've, you've hit the, as you always do, hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, they can be thinking any of those things. And, you know, even if you play the single notes on the piano and you say, I want you to sing this diatonic five note descending scale. Yeah. Um, then I say to, uh, the first thing I say to my singers when they've sung through, I go, was that all in pitch? And they stop and look at you as if, you know, I said, you know, did every note, was every note you sang, was was every note in pitch? And they'll go, oh, maybe, maybe the third wasn't. And I go, no, you're right, the third wasn't. So should we do it again? Because every time you practice that wrong note, because you think it's an easy scale, that is going to come, you know, processed and and endemic to what you do when you sing. Every time you hear that note, you might sing it slightly, slightly flat, you know, or something. So it's just, yeah, five note scalas. I start with them all the time. I go, you've got to nail these first before you do the grand opera scale. I'm sorry, you know. So I think that's very interesting because, um, as you've said, you know, the five note scale, the up and down, or just the down, it's absolutely ubiquitous. Mm. And I mean, with our um, you know, our five days to better singing teaching. That's the first thing we do on that course. We ask the participants to share an exercise and mm. they teach an exercise to someone else. Mm. They don't tell them what the exercise is for. They just walk them through it. And then we get together afterwards and we say, okay, what was your experience of that exercise? What do we think it was for? And it's amazing absolutely amazing what people think it's for and the kind of the words they come out with in absolute good faith yeah. um you know they have, they have formed their own inference yeah. from very straight what you think is a very straightforward direction yes. um, and and that's and you know what i think that's the exciting thing about teaching people we're mm -hmm. not teaching machines and yeah. you know and just finding that way through and going you know what they understand me now. They understand what I'm asking from them. But first of all, they've got to understand. They've got not to be, uh, not to be affronted by me asking them to do maybe a three-note scale. Mm -hmm. But I want to hear those three notes backwards and forwards in pitch. I, I think I said this last time with the more advanced singers and these um, pedagogy people are um, basically a cappella. I say that they all want to run over to the piano, and I go, "I'm sorry, where is your instrument?" Why you? Why do you need that? Why do you need that man-made thing when you're dealing with the most amazing instrument that no one can replicate? Scientists cannot replicate. They can blow in as many tubes as they like, and you know through pigs' larynxes and whatever, but they never can quite get the sound of a human producing sung or spoken speech, uh, spoken mm -hmm. sound. So sing, sing a cappella. Get be reliant on your own ear, and and then go to the piano to to check. Check in, yes, absolutely, but don't rely on it. So well, you know what? I mean, even, mm, even that, interesting. even that is so interesting because um, pitch is contextual. Again, mm. uh, context is everything. 
Um, pitch is contextual. So if you sing and you're singing your three notes and you're in tune and you go to the piano, you're then tuning to piano pitch, which is not orchestra pitch, which is not band pitch, which is not uh, guitar pitch. And who knows if that particular piano is actually even in tune? Right. I mean, if it's a keyboard, it's more likely to be, one would think. Um, but who knows? You know, uh, who knows who's bashed on it last, especially in the university situation. But, mm. you know, our pianos go out of pitch, uh, go out of um, tune so fast because students are banging on them and playing on them and and they're being left open and the, you know the aircon gets them and so i say no no you this is this is your this is your best tool and, and, and even even mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. um you look at classical choral tuning and you look at barbershop tuning and they are yes. so different yes absolutely in, as we in fact found out one, one one workshop we did we had 100 people in the room and 50 of them were classical choral and 50 of them were <laughs> Tuning was all over. We all over the place. thing together, and it was that was very, very interesting. You should have actually, Jeremy. I never know you to miss an opportunity. There was new music in front of you. This was contemporary, whatever it was, classical. I don't know, but Fusion. new music. Yes. There yeah. you go. Love that. New fusion pitch. <laughs> Um, Irene, there's one thing I, I want to draw out of you because I sat in on some of your lessons at the con. Thank you for that. You actually ask two students to do lesson observation while you give a lesson to a third student and then they go off and discuss together. Tell us about that because I think mm. that's a really powerful process. Look, this comes a bit from my own, well, a lot from my own experience. When I told you, when I started to really look at, you know, trying to understand voice science and really, apart from, you know, in real, with real people rather than out of a book, mm. plenty of books out there. But basically, um, my, the way I learned fastest and was able to make educated arguments in my own head about what I was seeing and not just taking it on as, oh, that's a professional, they must know what they're doing, but rather questioning. Um, was to observe. Mm. And the more people I observed, the more confident I became in my ability to assess what was going on. So I, that's something I did write into the program so that um, they basically, I think there might be three, you know, we, according to the, how strong the student is that's being taught, because mm. they have to, by the way, they have to agree to have people sit in. But of they course. become part of this cohort and they know that if they let people sit in on theirs, they can sit in on theirs. There's a, you know, there's this quid pro quo going on. And mm. so, um, so if, you know, not in the first couple of weeks, we, we settle them in. But then after that, I say, look, you're prerogative to say no, but then don't expect somebody else to allow you to do this either. Um, so, yeah, that, that I remember when you were there, there were a couple, but there could be up to four people sitting in. Mm. And the idea is that the, the group are taking notes the whole time. I tell them to be critical. And critical thinking is not critiquing someone. They're certainly not critiquing the student. If anyone, they'll be critiquing the teacher, which is me. And I'm, I'm you know, I've been around a long time. I'm happy to discuss anything they don't agree with, not in front of the student, but with me on my own later. But I ask them to go away and talk to each other, go and have a cup of coffee now and unpack what you saw and you know you you all took notes compare notes see if you picked up on the same things see if you disagree about certain things and all of a sudden they get very excited about that because all of a sudden they it's no there's no rote teaching it's mm. all about understanding and knowing that they can question a lot of them have come through conservatoire training and especially if they're classical singers where they were never allowed to question it, mm. whatever the, you know the master said was had to be right yeah mm -hmm. and um and so i wanted to undo that master apprentice uh thing to a point you know obviously you've got to have um to deliver the sort of in-depth information that we give in the program there's got to be some um discipline in the way we manage the way and students guidance. interact yeah. with us and the guidance i say to my students by the time you get into third by sometimes it's second trimester we're actually mentoring you mm -hmm. it's mentorship because you you know you come here you bring with you so much background as a performer and or a teacher or you might be a performer who's just starting to teach or you might be a teacher who's just actually not done a lot of performance so we can all learn from each other and yes so that what you saw is very common um let's say it's got to be the student who's being taught has to agree and they can actually say look i'd really like a lesson on my own today and it's usually because they're a bit fragile about something but mm -hmm. and then we just and everybody's fine with that like oh fine okay can we come another day yes mm -hmm. you know
Hmm. Very you know powerful I think, process. I think what's really interesting about this is is um, one of the, the phrases that you just said, and it, you sort of threw it away, but it's so important, is that people come with their own background. Mm. They come with their own level of skills. They come with their information. They come with their knowledge already. And right. the thing that you don't do is on the first day, you don't say... <laughs> Everything that you've just learned is nonsense. Yeah. We're going to instill you, you know, or, or you don't do that. You, you so, don't you don't rip up the book. You no. say, no. Great. Exactly. so you're coming from a particular place yes. and then you can help them reframe if necessary. The, we think the we reframing, think the same as you. Yeah, that we do. Yeah. If you're teaching already, you've got skills. You've got skills. Exactly. You're already good at what you do. The reframing is important because mm. um, and it's exactly what we've been talking about, which is you are uncovering beliefs that you have mm. and checking out whether they're actually going to serve you in the future yeah that's, that's beautifully said again jeremy mm. um so i just think that um it's not my place to tell anyone that what they that somebody else is teaching is when i know myself sometimes students will go out and do their thing and they'll say Irene bartlett taught me to do this and I went well I never taught you to do that you know I know that I didn't because I would never do that um so I'm I'm very you know to my colleagues I don't ever want to say oh that teacher teaches really badly mm. I'll go if anything possibly the message that they were trying to give the student didn't quite hit the spot you know mm. it was misinterpreted um and that can happen that's okay I, I ask them whether they've had classical or contemporary or music theater I always say the three um training where's their principal training been uh, so I know that's when I listen to their singing if they're you know if they're very CT dominant like Krakothara dominant mm. that's more likely to be a classical underpinning even and I said do you know what it, I don't ask the teacher's name I say do you know what your teacher's training background was mm. I wish she was a great opera performer that says it to me straight away. That's fine. Um, or, you know, or, you know, they, they get loads of geeks. So I went to them because I want to get geeks, you know, and I go, and then somebody will say, well, I know that my teacher went to a lot of conferences. So you can sort of, without mm. asking any personal questions, you can get that. And then basically I listen to them sing and I go, yes, I can see where the work's been done here and where it's either hit or it's missed. Um, or where you didn't understand. And so it's my job then to take you back to those things. So mm. let's leave alone what's working for now. Let's mm -hmm. not deal with that. And let's let's work on the things that are missing. And then we can gradually put the, the jigsaw puzzle back together again, but mm. without criticizing anyone, certainly not criticizing the student. It's mm. not their job to make sure they understand everything that you've said to them. It's your job to make sure they've understood. That's yes. my, my philosophy. Mm. Yes. Um, this has been amazing. Um, it's been so interesting listening to mm. you describe the process of setting up and the process that you go through with the teaching. Loving it. Um, we have to stop. I think yes. Yeah, that's that's no, felt like it's been really short. I mean, I mean, I'm glad you're happy. <laughs> It feels like there's a nice full stop there. Yeah. So thank you very much, Irene. Thank you for talking to us, and we will talk to you again. Thanks for having me back. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. This is A Voice, a podcast with Dr. Gillian Kayes and Jeremy Fisher. <laughs>